Good evening. Turn in your Bibles to Jude, the book of Jude, or the letter of Jude. It's between Revelation and 3 John. The title of this is going to be called Be Aware for the Fight. Be Aware for the Fight. This is a letter written to fight for the common faith, warning against men perverting it, and examples that are given of what could happen to them. And we'll start in verse 1. We'll read through it. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who were called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Or the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to come together and be able to read through your words, your scripture, the Holy Bible, Lord, that you've given to us to have another form of communication through you. Not only through prayer, but you have your written words for us to live by and to learn by and to share with others. Please use me, Lord, as a vessel that your Holy Spirit can work through in a state of humility to share this in a way that's where a child can understand it to go in detail and to explain it in a manner that there's nothing left up to ponder or wonder what's being said. Pray that you give me the discernment, give them the discernment to understand and comprehend it where they can use it, be aware of it and share it with others as well as you see fit. I love you. I praise you and I thank you, Lord. For it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's go with some backstory. So Jude, or in Hebrew, Judah, means praised. And it's short in Greek for Judas. Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, being that obviously Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit and Joseph was Judas's dad, and was the full brother of James. And like him, didn't believe in Jesus at first. He's mentioned with his brothers in Mark 6, 3, when, he come, when the outside people or people coming up to Jesus, he said, your brothers are standing outside. He named them all and mentioned his name being Judas not being Jude and he's one of the brothers mentioned in John 7 and we'll turn to that quickly this is when Jesus is going to the feast of tabernacles and his brothers question him saying verse 3 His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. 
So James didn't believe in him. Jude didn't believe in him. None of his family really believed in him, but Joseph, his stepdad, and obviously his mom, Mary. But after the resurrection in Acts 114, they were all believing. They were all in the upper room together. Mary, the other apostles, and then his brothers. Jude was a traveling teacher. He was a missionary. And in 1 Corinthians 9, it talks about him taking on, or one of his brother, the brothers taking on a, wife, a believing wife. And this book was written somewhere between 65 AD and I think 80 AD. So there's some differentiation between this and noticing throughout the book, this has a lot of comparison to Second Peter, as you'll see. So this is said to be written afterwards. There's a lot of correlation. I guess Second Peter is warning you of what's happening. This is hitting, this is a warning of what will happen. This is warning you of what's happening at the moment. And he was a missionary and a teacher to mostly just Messianic Jews and was knowledgeable in the Hebrew Bible and other traditional Hebrew texts or Jewish texts like the like Enoch and the Testament of Moses, which will be mentioned in this. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Jude, or Judas, a bondservant. This, the Greek word for that is doulos, which could also mean slave. The servant, the slave of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to those who are called, called to be saints from Romans 1.7, sanctified by the God, by God the Father, And if you read in Acts 20, 32, he'll build you up and give you an inheritance among the sanctified. Sanctified meaning set apart, make holy. And in John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So he's preparing the believers. God is the one that sanctifies them and preserving Jesus Christ. And in John 17, 11 through 12, Jesus keeps those whom the Father gave him in the Father's name. So they're preserved in the Father's name through Jesus Christ. Go to verse two, mercy. Mercy is defined as not giving you something you deserve or not giving you punishment you deserve. It's the opposite of grace. Basically, grace is giving you something you don't deserve or giving you a gift you don't deserve. Peace and love, which are two fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Peace and love be multiplied to you. And in 1 Peter 1 and 2, 1 Peter 1, 2 and 2 Peter 1 and 2, Peter wishes grace instead of mercy. And like I said, grace is receiving a gift you don't deserve. That's why the grace Jesus Christ gives us is unfathomable because like I said, we don't deserve it. He gives us a free gift we don't deserve, but he withholds punishment from us through him. So grace and mercy go together. He withholds, the mer he withholds punishment, which is the mercy, and gives us grace, gives us forgiveness, gives us a way out to salvation through him, grace. Let's go to verse three. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, or in Titus 1-4, common faith. So at this point, he was writing to them about expounding on the, the, the shared salvation. He planned to write a longer letter on shared salvation through Jesus Christ. But 
things changed when he had to be urgent and sh and change what he was going to write about. He found it, or I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. So instead of going out and writing about the salvation we have through Jesus Christ, and it was common among believers, he decided to write on contending earnestly for the faith. So in Galatians 3.28, in we're all one in Christ. That's the common salvation. And God saves us with everlasting salvation from Isaiah 45, 17 and 22. He saves us with an everlasting or an eternal salvation. But let's turn to Philippians 1.27 when it, we get to this contend earnestly for the faith. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One mind, one spirit, striving together for the faith. This faith needs to be always taken accountable because this faith is something that God can improve upon, can add upon, can increase. If you, there, I can't remember exactly where it's in one of the Gospels, but Jesus said when he was healing people, let it be done by your faith. And I think it was the one of the young boys he, he healed up, one of the fathers said, Lord, help my unbelief, give me faith. He, had, he, helped, he prayed and pleaded to help his unbelief. God can, God can increase your faith. Faith is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. That faith is a gift from God. In Ephesians 4, 5 and 13, we'll see one Lord and one unity, the unity of faith. Which was once, if we continue on, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So once for all brings that unity of faith together under one Lord. Go to verse four. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the lewdness. Lewdness is a behavior that is shameless, outrageous, or without restraint. Basically unbridled lust. They've turned the grace of God into that. Basically okay in any moral or it's a moral compromise, but any immoral living, basically. You're living in immorality. And in 2 Peter 2, you, we'll go ahead and turn there because there's a, this is basically a parallel to that. 2 Peter 2 and Jude have a lot in common. Like I said earlier, I believe Jude based a lot of stuff on what Peter was warning in 2 Peter. And he's writing a letter to address it as it's happening. So in 2 Peter 2, 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained light, precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, or Jesus our Lord. Or oh, I'm sorry, that was, in, that was one. Let me go to two, my, I'm sorry. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. 
and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetous, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber or will not slumber. So he's basically foretelling what Jude's talking about here. Their condemnation is marked out long ago. It's marked out in a sense of what's happening, what's happened before to other people that have denied God or been a disobedient to God. He's punished them for it. And if you go to verse 18 through 22 in the same chapter, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, that's again, shameless, outrageous, or without restraint behavior. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to, him, to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. They both mention the same word, lewdness. They, he's telling of what's going to happen and Jude reiterates it and shows that the false teachers are doing that at this moment. Now, when we go to verse five, now five is a transition. Five right here is where he's giving examples of what's happened from past rebellious acts, rebellious Old Testament examples and divine justice or holy justice is given by God. So we'll start in verse five. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, if you go to Exodus twelve fifty one, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. That was when the plagues were given to uh, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's hardness of heart he still, he wouldn't let his people go. And then that's when the, the Passover came, the death angel came, the ones that marked their, that marked the post with the lamb's blood, the death angel passed by and didn't take their child, which was Israel. And the ones in Egypt, like Pharaoh lost his son and that what broke his hardness of heart. He let him go. He let them go shortly after that. And afterward destroy those who did not believe. So in Numbers 14, 26 to 35, let's turn there. Numbers is between Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's the first five, it's the first five law books in the Old Testament. Verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who, have, who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. This is reiterated too in Hebrews 3.16, where, he where Jesus talks about, I mean, giving them rest, or the ones that rebelled against them. Uh, all of them did not rebel. Obviously, Caleb and Joshua didn't rebel. Everybody else did. 
You shall by no means in the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Verse 31. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. Forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year. Namely, forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there, there they shall die. So they wandered the wilderness for forty years, and those that did not believe kept questioning God. Never, everything, anything God did was not good enough, or it was they forgot about it. Basically, what have you done for me lately? They forgot about it. They questioned. They'd always go to Moses and Aaron. This ain't the end of it. They they would continue this throughout the Old Testament, and he let them down in the wilderness. They never made it to the Promised Land. Moses didn't make it to the Promised Land because of his disobedience. It was Joshua that let him in. Let's go to verse six. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain or own domain, but left their own abode, which will go to Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Well, I'll turn to Genesis 6. You don't have to. I'll read it to you. I like doing all the flipping to get through the cross references because this right here breaks it down. It lets you see it from the Old Testament while it's being brought back up in the New Testament. These prophecies, or not prophecies, but these reiterations, basically. Genesis 6, 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, that they took wives for themselves of whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he, he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants, or Nephilim is the Hebrew word, fallen or, multiple, uh, or mighty ones on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children of them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Enoch also talks about the book of Enoch. So this is one of the areas that Jude uses one of the non-canonical books. It's not in the Apocrypha, but it's a book that's that the, the Jewish people during the Old Testament or that were familiar with the Old Testament during the New Testament time would be familiar with, the book of Enoch. So this is Enoch 6 through 10, maybe have been quoted, or it was from the oral tradition from the book. But obviously it's not quoted in here. Enoch's only talked about in Genesis, and then he was taken up to God. So those angels or the sons of God, it could be angels. There's, there's some debate about that. They're the ones that had children. Had What they did was they had children with those women. And God did not approve of it, obviously. He, had, he God, has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness, those angels, for the judgment of that great day. And 2 Peter, again, 2 4 talks about God cast those fallen angels into chains of darkness. Well, the Greek word is, I think, Tartarus. So it's one of the, you got Hades, which is the Greek word for the, where if you die, you're in now. There's supposed to be, I think, two compartments. I think Luke 16 talks about this, where Lazarus, when he died, is in Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man went to the other part, and there's a gulf fixed between them, and that's where he's in torment. So there's nobody in hell right now. Hell would be, I think the word would be Gehenna, would be the other word, but that's a word for the trash dump or the trash area outside of Jerusalem. So you got Gehenna, which is that. That I think is supposed to be the word for the eternal fire. You got Tartarus, which is the 
where the angels are at now being chained up in darkness. And then you got Hades, which is where people are dead out would be it, or the Greek, the Hebrew word be Sheol in the Old Testament, where when you die, you either go to one or the other. Let's go to verse seven. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual morality and gone after strange flesh or set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance or punishment of eternal fire. So in Genesis 19, 24 and 25, the cities were destroyed after violent men tried to have sex with the angels. So if you look before that, there were some angels sent from Abraham and Abraham said they were there, they were going there to destroy it because of how immoral and I guess how degenerate like society is today. They decided to go there and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's very similar to the degeneracy, the sexual degeneracy, especially of today, if not more. Uh, bestiality was part of it, I guess. All these various sexual sins and these angels were going out. They visited Abraham. They went down there and, and to destroy it. And they told Abraham, or no, Abraham tried to reason with them. You know, if you find such and such just people, would you not destroy it? They said, yeah, for such and such people won't destroy it. I think he got down to a very low number. I think it was like five, or if not, I don't want to misquote it, but it's in Genesis, I think 18, before he went down there in 19, because Lot lived in Sodom. So they went down there to get Lot out. Well, the angels went down there and they went into Lot's house. Lot had his wife, his two daughters, and their husbands. Well, they were in there. These men tried to break in and wanted to pull the angels out there to have sex with them. And he was like, no, 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 no. He closed the door. And the angels were wanting to destroy that place. But Lot was trying to talk them out of it or whatever. And the men kept trying to come into Lot's house and pull him out. Well... The angels got fed up with it, and one man tried to reach in. I think he touched him or something. I can't remember exactly, and dazed him. And then they said it was enough. So they got, they told Lot, his wife, his two daughters, and her their husbands to get out. Get out by outside the city to the mountain areas or the next fallen city, because they're about to rain hell and brimstone, or rain brimstone and fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, the sons, they didn't, uh, I mean, not the sons, the son-in-laws, they they just, I think they just kind of over, overlooked it or they thought he wasn't serious. Well, the daughters and Lot's wife and Lot left. Well, they were, I don't know how far out, but Lot's wife looked back to see everything, told him not to look back. They looked, she looked back and she turned to salt. She couldn't let go of her past. That's a good metaphor is she had to look back into I guess reminisce a little bit or see it for herself. Well, they kept going. They went up in the mountains. And so they destroyed the city. And Second Peter 2, 6, going back to Second Peter again, reiterates the destruction, making them an example for the ungodly people that would come after them. See, these are all just examples of Israel, or not Israel, Egypt, the angels or the sons of God, and then Sodom and Gomorrah. These are all just warnings of those rebellions and those in God's divine holy justice against them. And it's sad that you, you, know, you have to bring it to remembrance because people tend to forget this stuff. They don't read their Bible. They're not familiar with the scriptures. They don't take the time to be aware of this stuff. So when false teachers creep in or people try to bring on false doctrine or try to twist things, whether it be like the Catholics, the JWs, the Mormons, whatever it may be, trying to blur the lines of Christianity and the deity of Jesus Christ, you need to be aware of this stuff. You need to be cognizant. You need to be prepared because people, and even atheists and stuff, or those that have a war against Christianity, which is most of society, you've got to be prepared to defend the faith, to fight for the faith. Because if not, and you're not secure in your own faith, they could make you doubt your own faith. And a lot of people nowadays are starting to leave the faith or be apostate or however you want to word it because 
they were either a never truly converted, and it goes to back to the parable of the the soils, I think is what it is, where Jesus is talking about, I think Matthew 13, 12 or 13, somewhere around in there, where Jesus is talking about the four soils. And that's ones that have been choked up by the world or not there on shallow ground and the sun dries them up and they were, root, were rooted. That's kind of the situation where if you're not prepared and you aren't feeding your faith or feeding your spiritual side with prayer, with your relationship with God, living it, without moral compromise, making Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Prayer, prayer. you should be praying throughout the day and then reading the Bible and sharing it with others, using your spiritual gifts to edify people. All the spiritual gifts we have are made to edify others. We need to use them. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 4. If you're a Christian, you need to be aware of your spiritual gifts. You need to use them properly. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about the order in the church and using spiritual gifts in an orderly manner because God is not a God of disorder. So you need to be grounded in your faith. That's why you need to defend your faith. You need to be able to fight for your faith. Verse 8, likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries or glorious ones. Second Peter 10, again, going to Second Peter, despite uh, 10 talk about the false teachers despise authority and they speak evil of them. I'm going to go to 2 Peter since we've been going back and forth on it anyway. It's only a few books over. 2 Peter 2, 10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries or glorious ones. It's the, it's the same word. And Exodus 22, 28 talks about do not revile God or the rulers. But people don't respect their government. They don't respect the rule. Now, that does not okay the sinful and the anti-God, anti-Christian agenda of the West in today's society. I don't want to get into politics or anything, but that does not okay that. Like certain laws and certain views and certain agendas that are out by the government are very anti-Christian. They're not of God. And books are, I think it's First Peter, somewhere in First Peter, and then some and then Romans 13 talks about being under the government of the governing authorities. Well, they're there to create an atmosphere for to keep everyone safe, but also there's it's gotten the point. This is, you know, this was written during if I'm not mistaken, Paul wrote that during Nero's time. And so it's not that bad now, but it's getting worse and worse over time, but he was saying that the authority, the governing authorities is established by God. So we need to respect that. And even going on to now, we have the governing authorities. So we need to live a orderly life, being in subjection to the government. But there's also things we need to be aware of. That doesn't mean you have to follow. Like you don't have to be for whatever law or view or whatever to pass by to that's anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-just moral in general. I try to keep my views is it moral? Is it biblical, Christian? God? Is it biblical, Christian, moral, logical, factual, natural? It's got to fall within those five. So you want to have a criteria they'll fall into, but biblical and Christian is the first one. Jude is pushing to compete for the faith that false teachers are denying with examples of their punishment. That's what this whole first eight verses were about. He wants you to compete for the faith against these false teachers, and he's giving you examples of what's happening. What's going to happen to them? Will you be willing to fight for the faith against false teachers? Are you going to pray for discernment and read your Bible enough to be aware of what's going on? Remember these examples. There's three examples. These three examples are consequences from the Old Testament. We'll dig in deeper next week 
or next time we dig into this to go through the, the rest of this book or the next section of this book, this letter, it's only one, one chapter, but he's going and showing these examples of what we need to do. Not only is he telling you to fight for your faith, be aware of the false teachers, but he's giving examples of what's going to happen to these people because they're not going to go unaddressed. God is a just and righteous God. He's going to address this. It might not be on our timing. 2 Peter 3, 9 talks about God's timing and his, he's waiting for everybody to come to repentance. He's giving them time to repent. But if they never repent, even Jesus warned. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7, 14 through the, uh, 15 through, I can't remember what verse it is. But he talks about false prophets, false teachers coming in the world. And, and even one saying, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in the name? Do we not cast out demons and do many mighty works in the name? And they'll think they're saved and people are going to think they're saved. He'll say, depart from me that work iniquity. I never you, never knew you. And they'll be cast out to, fight, to, to hell. <laughs> thinking they were Christian. People thinking they were Christian. That's why you have to be very particular about what you believe. Is it grounded in your relationship with God, first and foremost? Prayer, having that communication, that conviction, that God's speaking through your intu intuition, your conscience, your convictions, and being able to go off that, but also lining up with the Bible. We have the Bible for that reason. If it's contrary to the Bible, there's a strong possibility, and you get that you get that prayer for confirmation, you shouldn't be doing it. And Romans 14 comes on that with like liberality through Christ. So certain things that aren't in the Bible, obviously, that could be a sin if, if, if you have conviction about it and it bothers you, you shouldn't do it. Like how I feel about tattoos. I don't, even though I got sleeves, I don't plan on getting anymore because my convictions won't allow me to do it. Somebody else might pray about it and it doesn't bother them. They have that liberality. That's why we say pray about it. Something like that that's on... There's some gray area. There's no directness in the Bible about it, especially in the New Testament since we don't follow the Old Testament law. We're not under the Levitical law. The sacrificial law, that the moral law plays into play. And that's what's being talked about this is their morality from the false teachers. They're living immoral lives. Their behavior is dictating that they're false teachers by how they're, they're taking advantage of Christ's grace the grace we have through Jesus Christ, taking advantage, is giving it away to sin and okay sin because we have that grace. I think it's in Romans, I think, or Romans, or one of Paul's epistles, it says, should we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, certainly not. I think it's in Romans. Just because we have the grace doesn't mean we should continue to sin. And the teachers that push this, you need to be aware of it. Because we have this easy grace, easy believism, one saved, always uh, always saved thing where people don't believe in making Jesus Christ Lord of your life. When you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you make him your priority. He's number one. He's your mental from origin. And when you do that, everything should be taking him into consideration from beginning to end. And your life should reflect that. And if you're not doing that, you have never been fully converted. Now, you could be dealing with sin early on as a Christian, but if you haven't made that decision to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, and your life doesn't reflect that, there's no growth over time. You're not a new creation, per 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You, you're not saved. Because you have not put your belief in Jesus Christ and made him Lord of your life. Just saying a prayer or believing he's God, believing he's Lord, is repentance is a prerequisite to salvation. Just you have to have regeneration. And regeneration is repenting, making Jesus Christ Lord of your life and your life reflecting that. And that's why you need to address being able to be grounded in your faith, being able to fight for it, being able to defend against and fight against any false doctrine or false teachers coming your way. And you need to bring in remembrance to be aware of this stuff. You might know it now being that you're reading it, but you need to be in the in prayer, in the Bible, being around 
Christian, Christian counsel to hold you accountable. Do you really want to live for Christ? Your life should reflect that. And your faith will reflect that. And false doctrine won't get by you. If it does, it should light up a conviction or light up something in your mind where the Holy Spirit brings it to your awareness and you address it to see if it's true. Be a Berean. Acts 17, 11. Search the scriptures daily to make sure it's so. It makes sure it is so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to be able to read through this and start in Jude. This is a very underrated book. This is a very timely book in this time we're dealing with because not only did past books by Peter and Paul and Jesus himself, you Lord yourself, you warned us of this. But Jude is addressing it so we can be aware, so we're aware of it as it's happening and what to do. And we'll go through that throughout this set, these sections. But thank you for allowing us to be able to have this in here and be able to go through this and address people that are perverting your words, your scripture, you, and put them in their place. You say it's appointed, like it says in Hebrews, it's appointed a man wants to die for that as a judgment. They're going to have to answer for that judgment. And we as Christians that are guilty of or naive enough to fall for this need to be prepared and come to you and do our due diligence by praying for discernment, read through your scriptures. Strengthen our faith, Lord. Strengthen our give us the give us the discernment, the humility to be led by your Holy Spirit, and to bring it to our attention so we can address it accordingly in a godly Christian biblical manner. If there's anybody listening to this that isn't saved or they don't know you, put on their hearts through conviction to come to know you and receive you as Lord of their life, make you Lord of their life, to repent, turn from this world, the simple society, and come to know you as the living God, the only way to salvation, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for this opportunity and be able to do this, Lord, for us in Jesus Christ's name, I pray.